so some of you might remember that right after World War I ended, 1919 um we had a good old red scare where america became convinced that communists were everywhere plotting to undermine and overthrow america you might remember our um attorney general a mitchell palmer and his good buddy j edgar hoover went on a wild nationwide sort of manhunt and that all kind of faded away well that sort of mentality and fear and paranoia are going to reemerge in the early years of the cold war now, I've got to back up a little bit to help this be a little more discernible or make a little more sense. For those of you who aren't really aware of, of what is taught in the Communist Manifesto and what is sort of the communist goal or mindset or game plan, there is a very international feel or message in the Communist Manifesto and in traditional communist thought. In the concept of, you know, for example, we'll have a revolution in Russia, and then we'll spread that revolution to neighbors, and one by one we will topple the, the capitalist system everywhere and replace it with communism. So there is a definite, like, long-term goal to wipe out opposing systems and replace them with communism. That, in part... Um, the fact that, that that's kind of baked in, if you will, into communism helps explain also why we were convinced that basically all communism flowed from Moscow. We were convinced that since the communists had been successful in taking control of the Soviet Union, that they were using the Soviet Union as their base to spread communism worldwide. This also goes back to the fact that not long after the communists successfully took control of the Soviet Union, they basically started these organizations to promote and spread communism around the globe. Um, they, they basically forced communist parties in other countries to sort of pledge allegiance to the communist leadership in Moscow in order to receive any um, funding or support per se. Actually, I just wanted to double check. It was called um, the Communist International. It was actually covered in, in Chapter 19, if you remember, when we did the Red Scare. So we had for a while had this, this view or mindset that worldwide communism was this vast conspiracy directed by minions, so to speak, in the Soviet Union. And the idea that you have this friendly neighborhood communist we believe that that was a myth. There was no such thing as your friendly neighborhood communist. We were convinced that all communists were, at some level, agents of the Soviet Union. That communism was one massive united movement, monolithic communism, as I term it, meaning all from one stone. You know, that there was no branches, there were no deviations. It was just one massive united group. Now, the Red Scare that came during the cold war and it in part also um helped reinforce or or add more fuel to this model of the communism model it all really started to begin thanks to mr igor gazensku igor gazensku was a russian working at the soviet embassy in ottawa canada he decided in september of 1945 to defect to switch sides um, to to start working for the west so he walked out of the embassy there in Ottawa, Canada, the Soviet one. He walked down the street to the Canadians and basically said, I'm here to defect. Uh, the Canadians, of course, called up the Americans and said, hey, we've got this Russian. He's looking to come and play for our team. He brought a briefcase full of documents. We checked out the documents that he brought, and we were horrified. We found evidence that the Soviets had for several years now been staging a massive effort to infiltrate branches and organi you know, parts of the military, parts of the United States government. They had been trying to get communists into positions within the media, um, communists within various regulatory agencies, that the Soviets were not only spying on us, um, they were specifically spying on the Manhattan Project. They were desperate to steal the secrets of the atomic bomb. But we found out that not only were there spies, but they were subversives. There were communists all over the place 
at least it appeared that way, that, that there were communists in the government, in society, in all of these positions, and it, it put them in a position where they could undermine, that they could subvert, that they could kind of destroy or weaken American society, our government, our economy, whatever. And as the Cold War began to become more tense in 1946 and 1947, we started to become very convinced that they were that they were starting to move to the next phase of their of their plot to overthrow America. And again, this communist, this Russian, came to us with documents that that showed us that there were Russian spies in America, and there had been Russian spies in America doing Russian spy things for quite some time. So this wasn't entirely paranoia. There was proof brought to us from a Russian defector. In early 1947, right after he gave the speech for the Truman Doctrine, the president established what became known as the Loyalty Review Program. The loyalty review program was a system to screen all federal employees. Harry Truman basically tried to calm the American people down and say, look, I know everybody's worried about communists. Well, we're going to go ahead and double check and put everybody through a little screening testing process. And we'll, you know, we'll make sure there are no communists there. It sort of backfired because rather than make everybody feel better, knowing that Harry Truman and the government were going to double-check to make sure there were no communists. Most Americans immediately jumped to the conclusion of, there are communists in the government, we know there are communists in the government, we just don't know who the communists are, and so now we're having to do this so-called double-checking. So instead of making everybody calm down, it made everybody kind of panic, because it was the old theory of, why are you checking for communists? The only reason you would check for communists is you suspect there are communists, right? The Loyalty Review Program, which ran from 1947 to 1951, screened 6 million federal employees for loyalty. And that word is in quotes for a reason. Loyalty is not the easiest of words to define. That's kind of Lucy goose. Um, some people would take a more liberal or wide-ranging definition. Some would be a little more strict or conservative on it. That's kind of the problem, though. We're taking 6 million federal employees, and we're trying to make sure that they're good, loyal, quote-unquote, Americans. Now, what might be a sign that you're disloyal? Well, spying for the Russians is clearly a sign of disloyalty. But are there other forms of disloyalty? Are there other warning signs? that you are a loyal American. Some red flags that might have gotten you a little further screening, a little more intense scrutiny and testing. You rent, or I should say borrow certain books or purchase certain books from bookstores um, or from the library. You travel a lot to certain countries, or maybe you just travel a lot overseas in general. You're a member of certain organizations. You are a fan of certain publications or films or things of that nature. About 14,000 employees had enough red flags that the FBI gave them a little thir more thorough um, checking or background check. And by that I mean once, once you've got enough red flags that make us go, hmm, then the FBI will start to question your neighbors, question your coworkers. Uh, if you have kids, maybe they'll go and they'll talk to the, the school and the teachers and, you know, have any of them talk to you at a parent-teacher conference. Or, you know, do your children show any signs of communist indoctrination, things of that nature. They're going to start picking into your life pretty hardcore, which, even if you're not a communist, now everybody around you has the FBI knocking on their door asking all sorts of uncomfortable questions about you. It makes people nervous about you. It destroys your credibility. It makes people want to isolate you, right? About 2,000 federal employees quit, mostly because they were just sick and tired of the FBI rooting through their lives. Another 212 were fired for questionable loyalty, although no proof that any of them ever conducted anything like espionage or subversion. There's no real proof that any of them were working for the Russians. Their loyalty was just questionable. 
I like to point out this time, it's a good thing that it's not the Red Scare in the 1940s or 50s. I would be in deep trouble. For example, um, uh, there is no way that a teacher at a high school in this country, a Covenant Catholic, for example, there is no way that the history teacher at Covenant Catholic in 1950 would be able to assign his AP European history class the Communist Manifesto cover to cover which I do. I make my senior AP students read the Communist Manifesto. It's actually only about 40 pages, but still. Um, I make my students read the, you know, the Communist Bible, so to speak. There's no way a teacher would get away with that in the 1950s without at least some sort of authority doing a little more background checking. Um, you know, speaking of red flags, I'm probably on a government list somewhere. I bought a Koran after 9-11, not immediately after, but when I got the job at Covenant Catholic to teach World Civ, and I knew that I would have to teach about Islam, I went to Border Books. I don't even know if that company still exists, but I bought a copy of the Quran so that I would be able to answer questions about Islam and refer to the actual Holy Book of Islam. So only a few years after 9-11, yours truly, with his credit card, bought an Islamic Holy Book. I'm probably on a list somewhere. Um, just like how in the 1950s, had a teacher assigned some of the assignments that I assigned involving reading communist literature, you would have gotten on a list somewhere. Um, the government would have che would have checked into you, right? They wouldn't have just let that go. And so that's the kind of things that we were doing at this point. You know, we're firing people from their jobs because they, you know, they like to go to Czechoslovakia. They read a lot of books written by communist authors, things of that nature. Now, the FBI was screening federal employees, and that's easy for the FBI to do because, well, it's the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and these are federal employees. But it's around this time that somebody remembered that there was a congressional committee available. The House of Representatives in 1938 had formed the House Un-American Activities Committee. So this was one of those House subcommittees. Mr. Beasel knows all about these from American government class where we just recently learned about them. But this was one of those um, House special or select committees. It was created in 1938, and it basically allowed congressmen to use the power of Congress to issue subpoenas and demand public testimony out of folks to investigate communist organizations. And that's why it was formed in 1938. In 1938, it was formed to investigate communist and fascist organizations and activities in the United States because, as we could see, World War II was rolling in, and we were becoming very unhappy about the activities of Hitler and friends and Joseph Stalin and friends. The United States government wanted to keep tabs on those kind of people in our country. Well, in 1947, J. Edgar Hoover pointed out HUAC still exists. It's still on the books. It hasn't been very busy lately, but it's still there. We could use HUAC to have public hearings, right? Not some closed door secret session, you know, your lawyer's there, etc. You can still have your lawyer there, but we can have public hearings. Newspapers and radio will be there to record everything. Pictures will be taken. Answers will be published. There will be no hiding. And J. Edgar Hoover was adamant that we use the power of the House Un-American Activities Committee to have public hearings. Why public? Because the way he said, the way he, he thought about this, if it is a big conspiracy, if there are Russian spies all over the place and Russian operatives and people helping the Russians, we need to call them out publicly. We need to let people know who, who's the enemy, who's on the radar, who's suspected, all that stuff, right? The easiest way or the best way to fight one of these sorts of underground conspiracies is to bring all the players into the light. At least that's the way Hoover saw it. And if you think about it, it's not a bad game plan. It's, it's not a very fair game plan in a way because you're going to destroy a lot of innocent people in the process. But if I suspect that you're working as a communist agent, the best thing I can do if I can't prove that you're a communist agent is simply publicly insinuate that you're a communist agent. 
What that does is it makes everyone who's not a communist completely afraid of you, and no one will interact with you, and you'll become what we would term a social pariah. No one will engage with you. No one will have anything to do with you. And if you were a communist agent, basically your cover's been blown. I can't prove you're a communist agent, but I've made it impossible for you to do secret communist agent stuff because I called you a communist in front of God and everybody. If somebody were to actually associate with you or work with you, well, they would be basically labeling themselves a communist as well because I just called you a communist, and the only person that would probably want to be your friend is another communist. So you can see where J. Edgar Hoover excuse me, is taking the approach of kind of like hunting with a shotgun. He's not really aiming like dead on. He's just going to kind of throw accusations in broad directions and figure he'll hit some of the communists. Some innocent folks will get hit too, but, you know, you'll have that. And so the FBI began, you know, cracking down in all these groups and wiretapping telephones and reading people's mail and trying to help the House Un-American Activities Committee get all the evidence that they needed to have subpoenas and testimony, etc. In 1948, there was a huge break for HUAC, and it, it involved Whitaker Chambers and Alger Hiss. Whitaker Chambers, who was a correspondent for Time Magazine, an editor actually for Time Magazine, and a former member of the Communist Party, and a man who admitted under oath that he had helped the communists as a courier, meaning he had been a guy who had passed information um, to and fro, right? So Whitaker Chambers basically said, look, between 1934 and 1937, I was a courier. I was a delivery guy. Spies who wanted to pass information to the communists passed it to me. And then I met with communists, people in the Russian government, whatever, and I passed the info. My job as a man at Time Magazine gave me that flexibility. I could say, oh, I'm writing a story about such and such. I need to interview this guy. This guy would give me information. And in order to pass it off to my contact, I would just say, I need to interview this guy for the story, right? And he starts naming people who he passed stuff to and from. One of the names that he drops is Alger Hiss, a lawyer, a diplomat, and an advisor to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Alger Hiss is not just some lawyer, right? He went to Yalta. He was part of the American delegation that met with Joseph Stalin and friends at Yalta near the end of World War II and began basically devising the plan for post-war Europe. Whitaker Chambers says that before World War II, Alger Hiss, who even back then had been doing work for the had been doing work in the United States government, had given him secret documents to pass to the communists. Now, Alger Hiss at first denies ever even knowing Whitaker Chambers. He doesn't call Whitaker Chambers a liar. He says, well, I mean, he's calling him a liar, but he at first says, I, I don't even know who Whitaker Chambers is, right? Much less, you know, that I ever passed anything to him. So, yeah, Hiss is like, I don't even know who Whitaker Chambers is. I'm not a communist. I've never been a part of the Communist Party or a communist affiliate. You know, he actually sued. Whitaker Chambers um, for defamation and libel, I believe. Um, <clears throat> and, and basically, he just he vehemently denied everything. And a lot of members of HUAC were like, yeah, yeah, Whitaker Chambers, you know, some people took the stance of, okay, this guy got caught, right? Whitaker Chambers got caught. And to try and get out of being in trouble, he's throwing all kinds of names and he gave us a big fish. Right? He's making it up. And everybody's ready to drop it, except a young congressman, a guy who got elected in 1946. Um, so he's, he's only in his second uh, stint as a, as a congressman. Actually, he's in his first stint as a congressman. I apologize. A young Richard Nixon, congressman from California's 12th district. He says, no, we got we to gotta get to the bottom of this. You know, a bunch of other people on the HUAC committee are like, all right, yeah, moving on. And he's like, no, either Alger Hiss is a communist spy, which is a big deal, 
or Whitaker Chambers is a liar. And that's a big deal, too, because that means we can't listen to any of his testimony. Right? We got we to gotta find out who's the liar. And he keeps pushing and pushing and pushing. Well, as they continue to dig deeper and, and kind of ask more questions, eventually Alger Hiss is like, oh, yeah, I know who Whitaker Chambers is. Now that you mention it, now that I think about it, we met in the 30s. But he does one of those, like, like I met him at a cocktail party, right? I met him at, at some, you know, charity event. You know, I, I shook his hand. We chatted for a minute. I, I drank a drink. And, you know, we, we parted ways. We weren't really friends or associates. Um, you know, I am not a communist. I never really had any dealings with Mr. Chambers, you know. And he, as I said, sued Whitaker Chambers. Whitaker Chambers finally um, produced the Pumpkin Papers. So Whitaker Chambers told the FBI, "Look, I've got the proof. If you go in my in my shed, in my in my garage on the shelf, is an old hollowed out pumpkin. Okay, inside that pumpkin you'll find microfilm. Inside the pumpkin was what we call microfilm. Um, which let me go ahead and explain." I realize the longer I, I teach, the more I have to explain this because the less you guys are familiar with film cameras. So I'm sure some of you, most of you, have are at least somewhat familiar with you know the old way that we took photos with that whole special camera film. Um, so what microfilm is, is it's basically camera film. But what you do is you shrink down documents. So you take a picture of a document that's like a page. It's like a piece of paper, right? And that is, that is Richard Nixon. Um, but what you would do is you basically make very small photocopies of documents onto camera film. And then there was a special reader. And they still have these, I think, at the library, although they might have digitized all this stuff. Um, I haven't had to do this kind of, of research work in a long time, really since graduate school. Um, but like old documents, you know, when I wanted to to look at copies of newspapers from Cincinnati during the Civil War, which, yes, I did that at one point researching a paper, I went to the library, I requested the microfilm of the Cincinnati Post or whatever it was called at that time from whatever, and they, they came up with basically what looked like camera film rolls. I loaded them into a machine, and on this big screen in front of me, kind of like a projector screen, they would produce the document. So that long-winded explanation aside, these canisters, which contain all this film with secret documents, was in a hollowed-out pumpkin in Mr. Whitaker Chambers' garage. And that was the smoking gun, if you will. That was the evidence that proved that Alger Hiss was the liar and that Whitaker Chambers was telling the truth because Whitaker Chambers had said he had named some of the documents and basically, he had made photocopies of these just in case, right? This was his ace in the hole if he ever got in trouble. Some of the documents in the pumpkin papers were straight from the desk of Whitaker Ch or of Alger Hiss. They had Hiss's signature. They were the sort of things that had originated from Alger Hiss and his desk and office only. It, only he could have produced these papers. And so Whitaker Chambers, with his pumpkin papers, was able to prove that Alger Hiss was, in fact, um, lying that he had committed perjury because he had lied under oath to a congressional committee. He was later convicted of espionage as well, and there you'll have it. So as if we weren't freaked out enough, right, as if we weren't losing our minds enough, we now find out that one of the guys who went to Yalta and advised FDR was a spy, right? Moving forward a little bit, <clears throat> Another spy case that hit the front pages in the early 1950s was the case of the Rosenbergs, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Um, actually, so let me let me back up for a moment. In 1949, as I already said previously, in September of 1949, the Soviet Union detonated their first atomic bomb. And most people were convinced that there's no way the Russians could have figured out the bomb that quickly without having cheated or stolen some secrets from us. And we and the British began doing an intense manhunt to figure out who passed the secrets, who passed what. Right? Well, the big break actually started in, in, um, with a British scientist, a guy by the name of Klaus Fuchs, 
who admitted he had sent information to the Soviet Union. His testimony led the FBI to a couple living in New York City named Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who were members of the Communist Party. Um, but that's it. If uh, I have to, let me give me one second. Sorry, I want to take a moment to double check. Um, Julius Rosenberg uh, had studied as an um, engineer, primarily an electrical engineer. Uh, he actually had served in the military in World War II, uh, but was discharged when it was found out that he had communist affiliations uh, in his younger college days. He was married to a woman named Ethel, who had worked as a secretary and who had also been involved in communist organizations. That's actually how they met when they were younger. But these two were accused of being the masterminds that were in charge of a spy ring that had been responsible for getting the nuclear secrets to the Soviets. These two. And it was noted last year that our very own Mr. Holden looks like he is related to this family somehow. We'll get rid of him, though. Anyhow, these are supposedly our mastermind spies for the Soviet Union, Mr. and Mrs. Betty Crocker. Uh, they look very not James Bond, right? He looks like a very boring man. She looks like a very plain woman. And they were. They led very boring, plain lives. Um, but that's what made them great spies. Normally, this is the time where we in, in class take a little segue where I'll, I'll, you know, who likes James Bond? I'm a big fan of, of James Bond films. Well, used to be more so. They've gotten far too many special effects nowadays. But uh, I like James Bond films. But James Bond is horribly unrealistic, not for all the gadgets and high-speed car chases. It's because every time the guy walks in a room, the bad guys know he's James Bond. Like, what kind of spy does everybody already know your name? You're not a real good spy, right? The best spies are the ones you would never notice ever. Like they blend into the wall. They're so boring and unassuming. Um, if you really want to, to, to research some interesting stuff, look into the story of some of the, the greatest spies of the Cold War. They are some of the most boring people on earth. That's why they were excellent spies for many, many years. And what actually gets most spies caught is when they start to uh, spend the money that they get from spying, right? They do things that are out of the ordinary. They stand out. That's what gets them caught. But back to the matter at hand. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were members of the Communist Party, a New York couple leading a very, what seemed to be boring life in New York. And they were accused of being the masterminds managing a massive spy ring in the United States and that they had helped pass nuclear secrets to the Soviets. And supposedly the testimony of, of British scientist Klaus Fuchs helped get the FBI on their, on their tail. They were convicted of espionage in 1950, and they were both sentenced to death, and they were executed in 1953. As you can see there, June 19, 1953, both Julius and Ethel were executed for their crime. Now, a lot of people thought that these were some innocent folks who, yes, were communist, but that's the end of it. Um, that this was a, a group of communists who got caught up in a wave of Red Scare hysteria, and then they were kind of the, the pound of flesh, that they were the sacrificial lamb that the government needed, right? Well, turns out, actually, we know that they were guilty. We just couldn't tell the American people how we knew. How did we know? Because of Project Venona. In the 1940s, we had started a program to crack Soviet secret messages. Um, there was Your book says in 1942 um, that we were working on it. We actually started on it even before then, honestly. But thanks to Project Venona, we were able to read about 3,000 messages between the Soviets and their operatives here in the United States. And because of this, we were able to find out individuals. We might not have all the information, but we knew who was a spy and who might not be a spy and who definitely was a spy and what they were doing. And that included these two. Thanks to the testimony of Klaus Fuchs, it actually corroborated some of the information we had already cracked through Project Venona. We knew they were guilty. Now we had the confirmation. 
The beauty of Mr. Klaus Fuchs's testimony is it provided us with just enough evidence to convict them without the government having to reveal the fact that we'd crack the Soviet spy code. See, that's another fun thing about espionage. You gotta know when to reveal all your secrets. If America had not had any other evidence, and we accuse these people of being spies, the world would say, and what's your proof? What are we going to do? Walk in a courtroom and say, well, we got all these top secret documents from the Russians because we crack their codes. Then the Russians would know to change their code. All right? So you got to know when to reveal your info, right? And when to let the enemy kind of sort of get away with one. There's a whole, it's a whole game. You know, there are times that we know we've got an enemy spy, but we start feeding them false information. And that misleads the enemy. We don't actually arrest the spy. We trick the spy into passing on false information. And sometimes what you do when you find a spy is you bring him in a room and you basically say you got two options. You can either start working for us, you know, like we got you, and you're going to start passing on fake information. Um, and eventually, if we feel you've repaid your debt, we'll let it all go, right? Or we can just bust you right here. Um, there's a whole, there's a whole, like I said, there's a whole game to be played involving spies. But fortunately for us, we were able to keep Venona a secret. Honestly, um, Venona stayed a secret for quite a long time. We didn't shut down Project Venona until 1980. And we didn't make it public knowledge until I was in high school in 1995. Um, so we did not tell the American public the proof we had on the Rosenbergs until 45 years after they were convicted because we didn't want to tell the Soviets that we'd been cracking their codes for all those years. But the Venona evidence is what proved that they were guilty. So for anybody who thinks we executed an innocent man and woman, yeah, they weren't innocent. Matter of fact, her brother worked as an engineer on the Manhattan Project. So that's how this all went down, if you're wondering. Basically, he called up his brother-in-law, her brother, and got her brother to pass him secrets that he could then pass on to the Russians. Um, so we got our man and woman in this one. But the Red Scare is going to go deep, right? All sorts of organizations across this country are going to become, begin ferrying out the communists, right? Labor unions are going to start um, demanding that union leaders take oaths that they aren't communists. And if you are a communist, you're out of the union. Your book mentioned the University of California required 11,000 faculty members to take loyalty oaths and fired 157 professors who refused to do so. Um, the CIO, as I said, expelled 11 unions. They actually expelled entire unions who refused to remove communist leaders from within their own unions. Um, you know, church groups encouraged members to, to report um, members of church groups that were suspected of being communist. Everybody, you know, Boy Scouts, anyone you can name. There was a massive push across this country to you know, weed out the communists, right? To report on the communists. And um, just to give you a couple taste of it, you know, Red Channels. This was a pamphlet. There's actually a picture in your book. Um, published in 1950, this was a booklet that identified 151 entertainers in the radio and television industry that were supposedly communist and were helping spread communist indoctr indoctrination through their positions in radio and television. Your book uh, mentioned future president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, had to testify before the House Un-American Activities Committee because at that time, he was the president of the Screen Actors Guild. He was the president of the Actors Union in Hollywood. And they asked him, are there communists in Hollywood? Yes, there are. Are there communist directors? Yes, there are. You know, do they try and slip communist messages into their, yes, they do. Um, so Ronald Reagan testified that there were communists working around him in Hollywood. You know, this is one that I love um, that came out during the Red Scare. This is a, a flyer that was published basically calling on people to reject some government-instituted health programs of the day. But this is the one I love. Fluoridated water. Yes, fluoride. The newly discovered item... Uh, back then, fluoride, which, by the way, is in your toothpaste, 
okay? If you brush your teeth, you expose yourself to fluoride today. Fluoride was a new thing, and we were putting it in all sorts of products, but primarily in water to try and help protect our teeth. Well, it being a new, generally untested, at least over the long run product, you know, this, this says that basically fluoride is actually a slow acting poison, and that the communists have gotten us to poison our own water supply. The newly discovered cure for polio, the serum for polio, they accuse that polio did not have enough long term testing. And who's to say we're not injecting our people with this slow-acting, you know, long-release poison that will eventually devastate an entire generation of Americans? You know, all kinds of crazy stuff. But yeah, we had people saying that the cure for polio and fluoridated water were part of a communist plot. But really, things get out of hand with this man, Joseph McCarthy. Okay, by 1949, we're freaking out, right? The Russians have the bomb. The communists have taken control of China. You know, by mid-1950, the Korean War is going to wind up or, or start up, you know. Um, but in early 1950, right after Alger... Oh, that was the other thing in 1949. Alger Hiss, we find out he's actually a communist spy. In February of 1949, a senator from Wisconsin named Joseph McCarthy gave a speech at a, a Republican women's group in West Virginia. And during his speech, Senator McCarthy makes this following statement. While I cannot take the time to name all the men in the State Department who have been named as members of the Communist Party and members of a spy ring, I have here in my hand a list of 205 that were known to the Secretary of State as being members of the Communist Party and who nevertheless are still working and shaping the policy of the State Department. The guy says that he's got a list in his hands of 205 known communists. The State Department is aware they're communist and they haven't been fired, despite the loyalty review program, right? So the next day, he's getting on a plane, okay? Well, actually, let me rephrase that. He's getting off a plane in Denver. He'd flown from West Virginia to Denver. He's getting off the plane. A reporter says, yo, I heard what you said in West Virginia. I'd like to take a look at that list. You know, I'd like to publish that. Um, man, this is a news story. And McCarthy said, it's in my bags. I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, you know, I'm sorry. And the guy said, okay, you know, and the list never emerged. But there it is, the list, right? Joseph McCarthy kept, he always was telling you he's got a list of names. He's got a list of names. He's got a list of names. Um, he never shows you his list of names, but he's got a list of names, right? Gentlemen, Joseph McCarthy, um, you know, from Wisconsin, served in World War II, has been serving in the Senate ever since then. He had become a staunch anti-communist. He accused the Democratic Party of being the party of communism. Um, <clears throat> he accused far former Army Chief of Staff George Marshall of disloyalty and... Um, sort of being in bed with the communist, he accused Secretary of State Dean Acheson of being involved with communism. Um, this guy was crazy anti-communist. And he went on from his just generic accusation to start pushing other measures. Um, for example, he was one of the senators who was a big fan of the McCarran Act. Its actual name is the Internal Security Act, but it was sponsored by Senator McCarran, so we'll call it the McCarran Act. The McCarran Act declared that world communism has as its sole purpose the establishment of a totalitarian dictatorship in America, and that we need to find ways to fight the treachery, infiltration, sabotage, and terrorism of the communist conspiracy. And so the McCarran Act made it to where all communist groups and communist-affiliated groups would have to publish. First of all, they would have to register with the United States government. And then they would have to publish their membership, they would have to publish their records, their meeting notes, basically they would be denied the right to privacy. Any communist affiliated organization would have to basically become a public organization and not be allowed to have any sort of private dealings. 
we also said that communists, people that were members of the Communist Party, would have to register with the United States government. They would not be granted passports allowing them to travel abroad, and they would face other restrictions in their private life. Now, um, the McCarran Act also said, in case of a national emergency, we could arrest and detain communist and communist sympathizers without a writ of habeas corpus. Harry Truman vetoed the bill. He said, we're not doing that. Congress, though, easily overrode his veto and passed it in 1950. Fortunately, the Supreme Court would not really back it up, and whenever cases went before the Supreme Court, the McCarran Act, as illegal as it is, if you want to go from a strict legal stance, never really got supported. I say up here the McCarran Act is illegal. I know some of you say, Congress passed it. It's legal. Congress also passed segregation. Okay, Not everything Congress does is legal. Um, your issue here comes down to discrimination. What is the difference between a Republican, a Libertarian, a Socialist, a Communist, and a Democrat? Political party affiliation. That's what's different. It's illegal for you to say that a member of one political party is not allowed to have a passport, but a member of another political party can have a passport. That is the definition of discrimination. You are denying that person a passport not based on any illegal activity, but simply based on an identity. It's no different than saying Hispanics aren't allowed to have passports or, you know, Chinese people aren't allowed to vote. They haven't done anything wrong. Just because they're different doesn't mean they don't enjoy the same rights. That's why Harry Truman vetoed it, and that's why the Supreme Court doesn't didn't back it up when they were when push came to shove. Just because Congress had lost its mind and decided we were going to persecute com or Congress decided that we were going to persecute communists doesn't mean it's okay. After the 1952 election. Republicans took control of Congress, and McCarthy, because of that, got promoted. He became the chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on Investigations, which basically means he can use the power of Congress to investigate anyone he wants to. And thus was born what we like to call McCarthyism. It's basically a modern-day witch hunt. I always like to use the example of the Salem witch trials. Um, McCarthy's tactics were... Not what would be allowed in a modern-day courtroom. Let's put it that way. Um, first of all, I'd like to say I dislike most movies and TV shows that involve court because they give a horrifically inaccurate portrayal of court. You know, lawyers demanding the truth and, and witnesses screaming back and forth in long soliloquies, they don't happen in court, okay? That's not the way court works. And... Unfortunately, because a Senate hearing is not court, it's a different set of rules, which allowed Joseph McCarthy to do things you couldn't actually do in a court of law. But people acted like it was a court of law. They treated it like a court of law. And it was a witch trial. McCarthy would badger witnesses. He would, they would answer, and he would just say that they were lying. Or he would twist their answers, or he wouldn't let them fully answer. And he basically got it to where people would say and do whatever it took to get out of the crosshairs of Joseph McCarthy, like the Salem witch trials. I believe you guys read about that or studied it in English class. But basically what happened is someone got accused of witchcraft. And the only way to save yourself is to say, you're not a witch. You're under the spell of another person who, in fact, is a witch or cast a spell on you. Point the finger, right? I'm not really a witch. I'm a victim, you know, working for this other person. And you point the finger. That's what happened with Joseph McCarthy. He accuses you of being a communist, right? And it doesn't matter what you say or do. He keeps calling you a communist and twisting your words. So the only way to save yourself is to point the finger at somebody else and yell, no, he's really the communist. You know, I'm not a communist. It's, you know... It's all because that guy, you know, he told me to read that magazine. He told me to come with him to that meeting. You know, he's the communist, and I didn't know he was a communist until he already kind of sucked me in, and I didn't know what to do, you know, and then Joseph McCarthy moves on to them, right? And people just keep pointing the finger, desperately trying to save themselves, each step along the way destroying one another, right? 
again, if we were in class, we would have a lot of fun with this because I would kind of mimic Joseph McCarthy on one of you, and it gets really awkward and uncomfortable because I'm just yelling at you, right? And that's what Joseph McCarthy did. He just badgered people. Well, <clears throat> in 1954, the United States Army conducted its own investigation into whether it had spies operating within it, right? There were Soviet spies. Well, let me see. McCarthy. McCarthy said that there were spies in the U.S. Army. And the U.S. Army said, no, there aren't. We did an investigation. We found no spies, no espionage. You know, we thoroughly cleaned our house. We're good. Joseph McCarthy said, no, you didn't. You're lying. <laughs> there are spies in the U.S. Army, and you just don't want to admit it, right? Your investigation was a sham. I'm going to investigate the U.S. Army and find the spies. And so in 1954, Joseph McCarthy starts questioning people in the U.S. Army about spies in the U.S. Army. He's questioning all sorts of people. He's questioning army lawyers. He's questioning generals. He's questioning, he questioned people that had been heroes in World War II in Korea. I mean, everybody's on the stand. And finally, he went a step too far. He began going after Joseph, or excuse me. So one of the major lawyers representing the U.S. Army was a guy named Joseph Welch. And McCarthy brought up the fact that a guy working at Welch's law firm had, back in the 40s, been a member of a communist front, briefly. Now, what I mean by that is, like, the guy had joined a club and then quit as a member of the club shortly after he joined when he realized it's communist and that's not his thing, right? Um, but Joseph McCarthy brings up the fact that in the 40s, this guy had tried out this communist organization. And that's when Joseph Welch just snaps. Because what McCarthy had done in that moment is destroyed this young man's life. He had basically accused this guy of being a communist in front of all of America. This was televised. This was on the radio, right? And Joseph Welch famously said, um, You have done enough. Have you no sense of decency, sir, at long last? Have you left no sense of decency? Um, and this was the beginning of the end for Joseph McCarthy. And I want to point out that I put a link on our um, YouTube page. If you want to hear Joseph Welch say this to Joseph McCarthy, I have the clip. It's at around 103 or 104 is when he starts saying this. So if you'd like to hear Joseph Welch accuse um, Mr. McCarthy of having no decency left, sir, it's, it's around there on that clip. It's... Um, it's actually the clip, have you no sense of decency, sir? But anyhow, that was the beginning of the end. Um, Welch said what a lot of Americans have been thinking. Here we had been going on for months, months of this guy questioning, badgering, accusing, pointing fingers, humiliating people, destroying lives. And just like the original Red Scare, just like A. Mitchell Palmer, and just like J. Edgar Hoover, Back in 1919, always accusing us of communists everywhere, right? Always saying that they were one step away from cracking the conspiracy. Remember, Welch had predicted, not Welch, excuse me, Palmer had predicted a massive communist uprising on May the 1st, 1919, and nothing happened. Or 1920, excuse me, and nothing happened. Same thing here. Joseph McCarthy keeps saying words like his list, right? And he's got communists, and he's going to tell you who the communists are and where they are. Just listen to him. After several years of this, this guy has yet to produce any communists. He's yet to uncover any vast conspiracy. We've got a lot of accusations and not a lot of convictions. And so this was the beginning of the downfall of Mr. McCarthy. The Senate later that year voted a vote of censure, which is formal disapproval, it is, it is really the worst thing that can happen to a senator next to impeachment. It basically is a letter in your file from the United States Senate saying you have been a bad boy. It's really embarrassing. McCarthy faded from public view. He remained in the Senate, but basically no one listened to him. He died in 1957, and many people will say he died of a broken heart, convinced that the communists had won. Now... I've mentioned it um, several times. In 1949, the Soviets detonated their first atomic weapon, codenamed Joe one after Joseph Stalin. It was basically a carbon copy of the bomb we dropped on Nagasaki, or a carbon copy of our first atomic test, the Trinity test. 
Um, well, we took it to a whole new level. In 1952, um, the United States tested the world's first hydrogen bomb, codenamed Ivy Mike. Um, the hydrogen bomb is hundreds, if not thousands of times more powerful than the atomic bomb. You see, there are two types of way to make an atomic bomb, an atomic weapon, okay? You've got the A-bomb, all right? And you've got the hydrogen bomb, okay? Two different bombs. They're both nuclear weapons, but they use two different nuclear principles. An A-bomb uses nuclear fission, which means splitting atoms, right? So you take an atom and you split it into smaller parts, and there's a release of energy during that splitting, okay? This is powerful, but there's a limit to how much power you can get out of this. Um, I don't care if you built an atomic bomb the size of Covington Catholic. It's only going to get up to about 500, 600 kilotons of explosive power, which is a lot. Don't get me wrong. 600,000 tons of TNT is a lot of explosive power. But that's it. Again, that's a bomb the size of a school. Okay, There's just a limit to how much power that's produced by fission. A hydrogen bomb is the product of fusion. The combining of smaller atoms into a larger form, right? So you take two smaller ones and you combine them and you create a bigger one. And that actually releases more energy. A couple things. One, this, you have been watching an H-bomb go off every day of your life. It's called the sun. The core of every star in the universe is nothing but a gigantic chain reaction fusion, right? Fusion chain reaction, excuse me. So when we build an H-bomb, we are recreating the very center of the sun for a brief moment in time. Think of all the energy and power that comes out of that thing, right? Now, in order to create the conditions for fusion, you need a lot of heat and pressure. The only way to create that much heat and pressure is to actually set off an A-bomb. So a fun fact, inside every H-bomb is an A-bomb that gets the process started. But we go from kilotons, which again will mess up your neighborhood, to megatons, which will mess up your city and tri-state region. Okay, These things are measured in megatons, millions of tons of TNT. But the Soviets developed one nine months later. Only nine months later did the Soviets catch up and match us, H-bomb for H-bomb. Actually, if you want to get technical, they made a bomb that actually you could use. Ivy Mike was massive, and there's no way you could have used it as a weapon. It was like an entire building, but it was very experimental. The Soviets actually made one you could drop out of an airplane. Gentlemen, we now are facing the real prospect of a full-out nuclear war where, city, where not only cities, but the regions around cities will be wiped out. And the, the nuclear war really, or the, the threat of nuclear war ramped up. I will make an entire video about nuclear weapons and nuclear war. It's a topic I really get into, um, and most of my students tend to enjoy, so I will make an entire video just about that. This is a picture of the largest nuclear weapon ever built. It's detonation, actually. The Soviets made one and detonated it in the early 1960s called the Tsar Bomb. Um, it went off with the power of 50 million tons of TNT. Um, this is a picture taken many, 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 many miles away from the bomb, as is this. But we'll talk more about it. Um, but now we live in a world where both we and the Soviets are armed with these incredibly powerful weapons that will wipe out large chunks of real estate in the blink of an eye. And now comes the reality of, can we survive in a world with nuclear weapons? Will we survive? How do we survive? Another interesting thing about nuclear weapons is they have that wonderful byproduct called fallout. Um, that's sarcasm, by the way. It's not a wonderful product. But it was an unheard of product of a weapon. You know, when a, when a bomb goes off, usually it either kills you or it doesn't, right? That's it. Well, with a nuclear weapon, it goes off. And a lot of debris gets sucked into the, the radiation, 
right, of, of the weapon and gets tossed up in the atmosphere. And it snows, it rains back down like, like snow because it's generally in the form of ash. So it's lightweight particles that snow back down and they're radioactive and they irradiate everything that they fall on. So you might be living many miles away from a nuclear bomb that goes off. And, I mean, you're so far away, the, the explosion doesn't affect you at all, right? I mean, there's like a little flash off in the distance. That's it. And then an hour or two later, it starts snowing. That's radiation. That'll kill you. And so we have to, we have to predict how do we survive the fallout. There was a, a study done by the U.S. government that for every person killed in a nuclear blast, they estimated four more people would die from the fallout. Um, and so you have this massive you know, push to create fallout shelters you know, bomb shelters, uh, places where you not only will be able to survive a nearby nuclear blast, but you're going to have to hide in there for several weeks after a bomb goes off to avoid the fallout and things of that nature. Um, and again, we'll talk more about this when I look at nuclear weapons, but I do want to say, just in general, you've got to convince people that they can survive nuclear warfare. Why? Because you have to remember in the early 1950s, it seemed like a real possibility. And you've got to convince people that this isn't a no-win situation. You've got to convince them that if the air raid sirens go off, we're not all going to die. Um, you need people to follow orders, so to speak, and, and at least you know try to survive. Now, I will point out that the, the bigger question is, is the government being honest and can you survive? Well, that depends on when you ask the question. In the early 1950s, when the number and size of nuclear weapons were nowhere near what they were at the peak of nuclear weapons um, in the 1980s, I want to say, um, yeah, you know, in the early 1950s, nuclear war would not wipe out mankind. There simply weren't enough nuclear weapons. Um, even in the 19, early 1960s, I, I think nuclear war was survivable for a lot of people. But then we got to a magic point, so to speak, where the number of nuclear weapons that would be used in a nuclear war, um, they might produce an effect that we had never really thought about. It's called nuclear winter. The idea is if enough nuclear explosions go off at once, they're going to throw a lot of dirt and debris high into the stratosphere, like really high up. And it's going to literally get trapped up there in the jet stream, and it's not going to fall for a long time. If you get enough of that garbage in the high atmosphere, it'll start to block out sunlight. And it will reduce the amount of light available for plants to photosynthesize, meaning a lot of plant life would die off. It's going to drop the temperature because it's going to reflect sunlight. So not only are plants going to have to try and survive on less sunlight, they're going to have to try to survive in lower temperatures, which means there's going to be less food for animals to eat. And I'm sure some of you are able to follow the domino effect there was a real possibility that you could survive the nuclear war and then die months later from starvation and such as basically life on the planet gets wiped out in this winter scenario. You know, there was this theory that you could have a person living in the rainforest hundreds of miles from any nuclear weapon target, right? And they would eventually die within a year because the earth would become uninhabitable. Now, this is obviously all theory and speculation, but it's one of those interesting issues that came up as time went by. People began to ask, can you even survive a nuclear war even if you have the best fallout shelter imaginable? And lastly, I'll touch on it. I don't have a slide dedicated to it. But, you know, pop culture in the Cold War, um, all sorts of books and films, you know, and TV um, talking about, you know, spies and communists and things of that nature. Um, Looking back at it, I'm sure some people, you know, joke about it or make fun of it, but we're not so different. Um, in the post-9-11 world, we have had a flood of TV shows and movies where the bad guys are Muslims or Arabs or Arab Muslims or fundamentalist Muslim terrorists or terrorists or, you know, and the only reason I bring that up is, you know, when I was a kid, we didn't have any movies like that. Um, when I was a kid, the bad guys were usually communists or Russians. 
Um, you know, I mean, when I was a kid, we had the G.I. Joe cartoon. And, I mean, Cobra Command weren't exactly communist, but they also weren't fundamentalist Islamic terrorists, right? Um, when I was a kid, the original Red Dawn movie came out where we got invaded by the Soviets, right? Um, we had the Rambo movies, like Rambo 3. He went to Afghanistan and fought the Russians, you know? Um, we didn't have any of the stuff, you know? We didn't have all of these shows where everybody's in the Middle East fighting terrorists. And so that's a modern um, kind of connection to what I'm talking about with this Red Scare. I know that we can look in our history and make fun of people in the 50s for seeing communists everywhere. But I can tell you that in the last almost 20 years, there has been a just immense amount of emphasis on terrorists and terrorism and fundamentalists in these various groups um, because they are the threat that we are most concerned about in our modern day America. The threat of communism has largely disappeared um, and it has been replaced by this new enemy, so to speak. Um, but that is a, a, a story that I'll kind of pick up on a little bit more coming up. Um, when we go to Section 4 and look at the presidency of Dwight Eisenhower, as I said, I will also do a little more uh, of a detailed look at nuclear weapons and nuclear war. Um, again, something people usually take a little more interest in, but since we're not in school, I'll make it a separate lesson. Uh, not a required one, but for those of you interested, it'll be available.